You are now listening to Bigfoot and Beyond, featuring the OG bad boys of Bigfoot, the Dr. Heckle and Mr. Jive of Squatchology, the Chip and Dale of Bigfoot, and I'm not talking about the cartoon. Please welcome your hosts, the Bigfoot celebrity couple, Biff Clobo, better known as Cliff Berrickman and James Bobo Fay. Hey Cliff, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? All right. You know what today is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's today. It's the 100th episode of recording Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo, so we had to get a real special guest, a big hitter for the 100th episode special. Yeah, and I think we succeeded in that. I'm excited about today's episode. I've got a lot of questions, of course, so should we just hop into it? I'd say so. All right. So everybody listening, um, please welcome Dr. Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State University, professor of anatomy and I think physiology, but he's definitely in the anthropology department. But God, if you don't know who Jeff is, I don't know why you're listening to this. So Dr. Meldrum, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sparing an hour or so of your time today. Oh, you bet. I'm honored. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, we really, really appreciate it. And of course, Jeff, you do you do a lot of these things um, all the time, basically. Um, so thank you very much again, just for coming on. Um, and, and cause you know, the finding Bigfoot thing kind of put us on the map, but you know, your academic work put you on the map and that's an entirely different thing. Well, thanks. Yeah. It's, uh, all, all perspectives, uh, have some to offer, I think. So, well, um, now Dr. Meldrum, uh, we were talking before we started the recording that you've actually been catching up on the finding Bigfoot episodes. Like what possessed you to do that? <laughs> well, I had, I had some, uh, time on my hands, uh, and, and I just, you know, wanted to be able to uh, see what's been done. That's the thing. I mean, I, I had a sense of, of what you all were up to, but uh, had only, only watched. I think you actually you gave me a couple of thumb drives several uh, years ago, several seasons back, and I was able to catch up a little bit. But it's been really fun to sort of go through. And as I've had questions about maybe a particular region that has caught my attention or, or uh, you know, some encounter or some account or report has uh, has uh, emerged i've gone back and looked at some of your experiences and and uh, you know the, a little about the geography the town hall meetings it all it all just helps me to put myself you know in the uh, in the environment in the in the picture a little bit and it's been really fun to know you guys <laughs> better from uh, from the perspective of your activities and and approaches to the evidence. It's uh, been a, a fun uh, catch up. And some novel ideas of how to attract a Sasquatch, too. I know. I, I watched that episode in Pocatello very carefully, uh, but uh, I still haven't got the rave ball yet to set up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we get a lot of heat, you know, especially from the hunters and stuff, you know, or say, that's no way to get an animal. And so, well, we know that, but like, who's going to watch, you know, Cliff sitting in a tree stand for four hours silently? That's lame. That's bad TV. It might might not work for their animals, but it can work for the Sasquatch. We know that. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that is the question, you know, the curiosity of a, of a somewhat higher intellect, you know, smarter than the average bear, as Yogi would say. I, I think there is an element of curiosity and interest in, in our activities and you know, the sights and smells of, of uh, campsites or cabins and backyard barbecues. I think, uh, I think all those elements uh, have the potential, uh, you know, if you're in the right place at the right time or if the Sasquatch is in the right place at the right time to, uh, to poke his nose or hit her nose into, uh, into our business. That's, uh, that's one way. Make it interesting. Yeah. When they meet their survival needs, like calorie intake, and they have, you know, a suitable place to stay. I mean, once they, you know, if, they, if they're in a really rich, abundant food source where they just, they can fill up a day's worth in four or five hours, like what else are they going to do the rest of the day? If there's some interesting thing going on, they're going to, they, they want to see what's going on in their territory. Um, they'll come, they'll come, they'll come to something like that, like some weird attraction. Yeah. And you, that, that's a really good point too, Bobo. And one that uh, uh, maybe turn on its head for a minute is, uh, for, for your listeners to think about when they, you know, I have people who come and lay claim to a, a Sasquatch, you know, poking around, harassing them or, or disturbing them, depending on their frame of mind, all night long and complaining about they're not getting any sleep because these things are coming around every night, all, all night long. Well, if you stop and think about it, that just doesn't make sense if it was a real flesh and blood animal that like you point out has 
needs. It has to meet those daily caloric requirements. It has to stay warm. It can't be exposed to the elements, you know, indefinitely and so forth. And uh, I think people need to think about that when they're evaluating what they're interpreting as a squatch activity, to borrow a phrase. Uh, and uh, I, I, that's important. That's, I think that's an important point. Yeah. And you know, one of the biggest things that uh, um, stands out to me with all the witness interviews and the nine years of finding Bigfoot and my ongoing Bigfoot little world that I live in here is that uh, people I speak to have a tremendous amount of, not not all by any means, I want to point that out, but a, a good section of the people, a good percentage of the people I speak to have a very, really difficult time differentiating between observation and interpretation. Yes, I've had uh, lengthy conversations where, you know, like just like you say, I've, I've spent time out with uh, with investigators, and uh, and and I will repeatedly point out. Now, is that an observation? Did you do you have documentation of that statement, or are you imposing an, an interpretation on your experience? You know, putting you know projecting yourself into the supposed mind of the Sasquatch, whenever. Uh, and, and this is, you know, if, if, if all our cards are on the table, this is one of the criticisms that's often leveled, not only at uh, Finding Bigfoot, but at, but at other um, documentaries out there, documentary series, is, is when assertive statements are made by the cast members that Sasquatch like this or Sasquatch do that, or as if <laughs> even my wife the other night, who was uh, indulging me in watching a few of these shows, she goes, how could they possibly know that? Why do they say things like that? <laughs> because I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. But uh, sometimes people don't even realize it. I mean, I was in the in the pickup truck driving with this fellow, and he was going on uh, relating some of these past experiences, and he, he'd do it. And I would just look at him, and I said, I'm just going to raise a finger every time you, you, you uh, cross the boundary from observation into speculation or, you know, or into interpretation. Boy, you know, my, my hand just kept popping up there. Like <laughs> I very often feel like raising a finger when people do that, but it's probably not the same finger you would choose. I was going to specify it was an index finger. Yeah. <laughs> or it might've made the, it might've made the point with a little more force if I had used another digit. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the na natural human condition is to, I mean, that's what a human naturally does is see it from, you're going to see it from your perspective. Everyone has a point of view from your past experiences, your education. And that's where the sciences really come in is because science, that's what they do is, is cut off your interpretation and just what's the facts, what's the, what's observable facts. Right. Well, and you know, we, we are by nature, a storytelling species. We, we uh, just, like you say, we naturally sort of connect the dots and fill in the gaps and you know our brains do this i just was uh, lecturing to my students about the the uh, special senses and uh, showed them you know we, we were talking about the blind spot the point at which the um, optic nerve enters the back of the eyeball and there are no photoreceptive cells in that spot it literally is a blind spot but um, we since we have two eyes uh, the one of the eyes is able to make up for the deficit in the other. But you can do this fun little experiment to show how your brain is so wired in order to fill in the missing information. And you probably have seen these little these little tests where there's a black dot and a little X and you cover one eye and then you move the you move the image closer and closer, staring at the X and suddenly the black dot disappears. But it's not just a blank. It, oh, the, the black dot is on a field of cross-hatching. But when the black dot disappears, there's not just a cloud there. There's cross-hatching. The cross-hatching pattern is perfectly complete. So you, your brain sees what the information is surrounding, the missing data, and it fills in perfectly well with, with that information what it is expects must be in that missing space and so we do that with other things too with with stories and uh and so it's it's all too easy for a witness to take these very tenuous uh, you know uh, bits of of observation and weave them together into a tapestry and, and then convince themselves this is what's really happening yeah, it's kind of, um, I always say, uh, I, I quote the Bible verse and add on to it, you know, like, seek and ye shall find. And I always add on, even if it's not there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because if you're looking for something and you expect to find it or you expect Bigfoots are in your backyard or you expect big whatever, they're going to be there, whether they are or not. And as part of not only our storytelling, um, I guess, epigenetics, I guess, I guess that's what it would be. Um, but it would, uh, we're, we're kind of a mythological species as well. You know, like uh, these storytellings and, and, and how the, the stories relate to our regular life. Um, you know, that that's our foundation, essentially, as a species. And I guess it's pretty hard to shake, even in our so-called enlightened era, I guess. Sure. Even, and even in science. Um, the, other, the other thought I was going to add to that, while I was a graduate student, there was a uh, an anthropology student, Misha Landau, who got her dissertation and quite some notoriety um, based on her research about how anthropologists tell stories, how they create these, these epic, these hero epics in their portrayal of the evolution of humanity. And you know, uh, forging out from the protection of the forest into the into the dangerous plains where there are these large predators and and so forth and so forth and and um, so even uh, even when we try to impose a discipline a scientific uh, methodology to our approach, we still can fall prey to that tendency to try to craft a narrative that uh, that makes sense i mean i quite honestly a lot of the paranormal if i can get myself in trouble here with half your audience and half the host yep so i uh, i think that's uh what leads to some of the acceptance of paranormal explanations is people uh, find their inability to explain in uh in uh, normal terms uh, their experiences. And uh, so uh, giving up on that, they resort to extraordinary claims or paranormal explanations. You know, if, if I can't find where the footprints go, then they must have just vanished into thin air. Even though I didn't see them vanish into thin air, that must be what happens. That's the only explanation for, you know, it, it, it disregard the fact that I'm not a good tracker and I can't follow <laughs> <laughs> a, a track way to save my life, you know, but I'll come up with, I'll believe that it, the Sasquatch just poofed into, into an orb of light and floated away. But, you know, but on the, on the other side of the flip of that coin, I guess the other side of that coin is that uh, we can actually mine the folklore of the past to hopefully find some information about Sasquatches. And uh, that brings to mind another finding Bigfoot episode. I don't know if you watched, I think it was in Utah. When we were there, we visited uh, Dr. Lynn McNeil, I believe her name was, um, a professional folklorist, you know, a PhD in folklore and all that jazz at, at the university there. And um, on, on our day off, she basically allowed me access to their folklore uh, files, and they had files on Bigfoot stuff. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And um, I, I went to the library and, and, and paid, for, paid the library to make me copies of the entire file. So um, there, there's a very rich... Obviously, there's a very rich folkloric um, tradition on Bigfoot stuff, as well as the native uh, and the indigenous stories. Um, but it, yeah, so that kind of gives us another in for some sort of research about the real situation as well. So yeah, that was Utah State. Utah State, okay. Yeah, no, that I, I agree, and I and I, uh, uh, you know, those elements are certainly very important, and they're and they're part of the human experience. So they are of value. Uh, there, there even have been some field zoologists who have recognized the utility of relying upon or resorting to, rather, maybe not relying upon, but, but using as a starting off point, um, the folklore, the, the stories about the wildlife in a given region that the indigenous people talk about. And oftentimes their ability to discriminate and identify um, species, even down to very uh, fine distinctions is is often remarkably accurate. I mean, a lot of good uh, field biologists. The first thing they'll do is they'll go to a village when they're when they're exploring for new species or trying to find out what the endemic species are. And and who do you interview? You interview the best hunter, the one that brings in the most the uh, you know most successfully um, brings in the game or or brings in rare and exotic animals. And you go through the litany of of what they're familiar with. And it's, it's a very useful tool. So it's not uh, the folklore and indigenous knowledge is not something to be, uh, to be treated lightly. Yeah. People throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, they talked to me and said, well, coyote, 
Coyote pulled down the moon and created this. You know, they're like, God, these people think the Coyote pulled down the moon out of the sky. You know, because they throw everything out with it, you know. But, yeah, but you look at the whole total of what they say, like whistling in the dark, you know, knocking or things that we can observe today. They're, they're right on. Right. Uh, absolutely. I think one of, one of the interesting little uh, tidbits that I gleaned from John Bendernagel's book was he drew attention to the fact that uh, while many of the names given to Bigfoot or Sasquatch by the indigenous people are, uh, translate to you know the hairy man or the wild man of the woods, a lot of them actually uh, point to natural behaviors. You know the the eaters of cockles uh, and uh, you know other other terms that describe aspects of their their natural history. You know here in Idaho, one of the Shoshone references uh, is the eater of children, which is a theme that's pervasive through many different uh, tribal groups throughout the Pacific Northwest and Inner Mountain West. And so, uh, you know, perhaps based on uh, real incidents uh, somewhere in, in the mists of time, we certainly know there's precedent uh, amongst the living great apes for that very behavior, snatching of human children or toddlers and consuming them. And so it's not, uh, I don't think it's a just so story. It's actually probably has a, based on a grain of truth of a real experience that then became, you know, since given the fact that it was such a traumatic experience became a central theme in identifying these beings. But, but it could be pretty rare, but it, it just the fact, like it could happen 700 years ago or it could happen seven years ago. And back before they had TV in Western culture, that story would come down, whether it's seven years or 700 years, it'd be like, yeah, these things eat kids. Right. It becomes part of the, the oral tradition, part of the characteristic, yeah, because that's a pretty distinct. It might be rare, though. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. It could be rare. Well, let's hope it's rare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what it sounds like, and, 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 and you, you probably have thoughts on this, but like – Everything that we know now, we're kind of almost even rehashing. Yeah, we know it and there's been new things uncovered, but we're kind of still in the same spot. Like I, I was um, digging through my files a little a few months ago and I ran across that essay. And I think it was Warren Thompson from the Bay Area group. Um, I think it was Warren Thompson or it might have been Archie Buckley. But I think it was Warren. Um, and he basically wrote what we know about the Sasquatch. And it's a few page essay. And I was reading through it and thinking, we really haven't moved on so far from here. And I think that was written in 71 or 72. So, like, what do you think the state of Bigfooting is today? And, and, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or do we have a direction? Or are we just, like, treading water? Well, yes, it, it feels that way sometimes, that we are just kind of treading water. And I you know that, that's been kind of weighing on me lately, especially, I guess, as I get uh, closer, you know, to that uh, – horizon of retirement and so forth and and uh, and wondering what 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 legacy what mark have i left and 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 what will be the trajectory thereafter but um, um you know i i i i've had that same experience I, I i wrote a similar kind of essay with richard greenwell when we put together a state of the science of sasquatch uh, it, it ended up not getting published. It turns out there was a curmudgeon on their scientific advisory board and, and it got kiboshed, but, uh, or the kibosh was put on it. I guess that can't make that into a verb, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 we can do it if we want. But anyway, um, it was, uh, it did not get published, but, but reflecting back on the things included there, you're right. There are a lot of, uh, fundamental aspects. Well, even <laughs> it's funny is uh, the, the next book that I'm working on is actually the more it, it takes shape. And as I, as I, uh, formulate and, and, um, flesh out the things that I want to accomplish in, in some ways, I, I realized in some ways I was redoing, uh, what Ivan Sanderson did <laughs> when he did his global, uh, uh, survey of subhuman, uh, creatures, primates around the world. And it's interesting how so many of the things that he concluded uh, seem to have been borne out by uh, the accumulating data that, w that we have. I guess what, what I'm hoping that we, we are accomplishing as this goes along, so we're not just treading water, not just doing the same old, same old, but as, as a scientist, I'm trying to 
lay some uh, more credible uh, foundational works and, uh, and, and trying to orchestrate others uh, um, undertaking such things, you know, um, so that uh, things like uh, uh, more uh, incisive uh, evaluation of the Patterson-Gimlin film, for example. I mean, it's interesting how as time has gone forward, we have increasingly sophisticated methods of um, addressing what is in that film, and uh, as well as a broader scientific context from which to interpret what's in the film. Um, but, uh, you know, my work with the footprints, there's, there are still lingering things that really need to be kind of codified and formulated and archived in such a way that they're accessible to researchers down, down, uh, down the pike. Um, but as far as new trajectories of research itself, I, I, well, I see a couple of things for me, it's, and, and, and I've said this before and we'll, we'll see if they, uh, if they're borne out in the future or not. But I think that the two prongs, one is, is in the field um, utilizing the ever increasingly uh, improved drone technologies and, and thermal imaging. And we see that, I mean, LIDAR is still another opportunity. There's little snippets of that that show up on, on some of the documentaries. Um, but I think LIDAR has an opportunity to, uh, provide some further insights, but uh, uh, and and in combination with that kind of uh, aerial survey, uh, helping to focus it using GIS to greater advantage. Um, I'm not, I don't have the skill set to really do that, but at every opportunity, I encourage others who do to take an interest. The other is uh, in the environmental DNA, that those DNA methods are uh, expanding, the potentials are expanding, uh, probably geometrically. Um, and uh, they, uh, there, there's a couple of aspects, a couple of challenges, I think, that that addresses. One is we, we have this dead end, not dead end, but a, we have this roadblock to uh, previous DNA attempts, analysis attempts, uh, which usually focus on hair, and the, the lack of a cellular medulla in that hair makes it very challenging to get DNA. That's further complicated by the fact that, uh, that if, uh, if this creature is as closely allied to the human species as, as uh, many suspect, then the difference between us and them as far as DNA sequence could be very, very small. I mean, we could be talking less than 1%. I, I recently kind of... Uh, pulled out of the air a little uh, analogy to help people to visualize what this means. Imagine we had an advent calendar. You know, everyone knows what an advent calendar is, a little, a little uh, panel with windows or doorways that open up in the 24 days leading up to Christmas with a little goodie behind each door. And the kids would anxiously wait for the next day when they could open and take that little piece of chocolate or little goodie or small toy or something. Well, imagine you had an advent calendar that had a um, 100 windows instead of 24. And uh, well, let's let's break it down even a little better than that. I say a 1000 windows. So a 1000 windows. And if, if um, each of those windows represents uh, a percentage of difference, and certainly that's not, you know, the difference is not homogeneously um, scattered throughout the genome. It can be in clusters and so forth and, or, or uh, comprise distinctive gene markers that are localized at particular points in the genome. But the point is, oh, well, you've got this advent calendar and there's only 10 windows that have any useful information for discriminating between humans and Sasquatch. But you have a study that only lets you open 10 windows because that's all the funding and that's all the time your, your researcher, your, uh, your uh, molecular biologist is willing to devote to it. And so what are the odds that the 10 little doorways you open up stumble upon one of those 10 out of 1,000 windows that will have useful information? 1%. 
Yeah. And if you don't find that, then what's your conclusion? The evidence points to simply being human, uh, your, your sequence being human. Jeff, excuse me. I have a question. Now, I know that, uh, <clears throat> that's what I understand what you're saying, but if it was a gigantopithecus and off that line, like if it's not one, less than 1%, like we think of it, if it's in the homo line, what percent like would it be like you're, you need to well, then it would fall if if it's if it if we're correct in in our current opinion, consensus opinion that uh, Gigantopithecus was most closely related of, of the living apes today was most closely related to the orangutan, as was suggested by some DNA research recently. Now that doesn't mean it's really really close to the orangutan compared to gorillas and chimps. It means it's just it's just somewhere on that side of the fence since the orangutan. Diverge, lineage diverged from the the hominoid trunk, and uh, and so um, it would therefore be bracketed somewhere in that range of distinction. So, like for chimps, values you'll see reported depending on which part of the genome is is being examined, anywhere from you know ninety four percent to ninety eight percent identical to to humans. And so I think Gigantopithecus, you know, we, we could be talking uh, a percentage or two or three more distinctive than if it was, say, a Paranthropus uh, or some, some offshoot uh, of a robust Australopithecine of some sort, um, at which I think is another viable hypothesis to be, to be considered. So I, mean, I guess my question is, if it was Gigantoline, we, we would know that already? Not necessarily. No, I don't think so. Because... Uh, Again, the studies that have been done, I mean, for example, I, I, did, um, I pulled some soil samples from the nest sites up in the Olympic Peninsula that, um, that the Olympic Project has been uh, examining. And those were examined by uh, Todd Disatel at NYU. And basically, he looked at one uh, portion of a gene in the mitochondrial genome. And he chose that one because it, it's a good one to differentiate uh, species of mammals and it works fine. He's, he, he pointed out when I, when I queried, he pointed out that it, it uh, identifies or distinguishes between humans and Neanderthals. There are like three markers in that stretch that separate Neanderthals from humans. So you would think if Sasquatch is less related to us than a Neanderthal, um, that, that, that it should pick up differences there. But the problem with that is the point that I made earlier is that these differences aren't just scattered um, uh, regularly throughout the genome. And even the comparison between, you know, when, when you use Neanderthal as a, as a, a benchmark, Neanderthals and humans have evolved one way, and, uh, and or, or and differing ways, resulting in the three markers that he's talking about, the three substitutions, not even really markers, but we can call them markers, but single nucleotide substitutions. Um, who's to say that a Sasquatch would have had those and more, you know? Uh, it, it could have evolved in ways that didn't affect that stretch of DNA that was being compared between humans and Neanderthals. So there's an assumption made there. I, and, I've, and I've brought this up. This is kind of an interesting uh, tidbit. I brought this up with numerous geneticists that I've come in contact with asking this question. Uh, is uh, uh, The question being, are we doing enough? I mean, is there, is, is there confidence are we justified in, in, uh, in confidently concluding that the studies that have been done so far, which usually produce one of two conclusions, uh, either w when human DNA, quote unquote, human DNA is identified, it's assumed, therefore, that the, the uh, witnesses have handled it and, and contaminated it in such a way that we're picking up their DNA, or that it's simply a misidentified human hair that's been shed. You know, in the, it's just cast about in the environment or one of the investigators picked up their own hair or whatever, you know. But the third option that is not really uh, raised is that 
we haven't sequenced enough to differentiate between what appears to be human and what actually is human. And, um, and so uh, these geneticists have uniformly said, oh, you're absolutely right. If I were doing it, they say, I would sequence the entire mitochondrial genome and at least, oh, a dozen or so uh, nuclear genes to really come to a conclusion, to draw a conclusion. Well, that, that takes a lot more effort and a lot more work and a lot more funding and time. And that's been the problem is uh, the funding not necessarily an insurmountable problem, but to get the, the, the lab to devote the time and resources to this question. Well, that's just money then, right? Because, I mean, I talked to you two years ago when we were in Colorado. I got to speak to you at length, and I believe you said that it was the guy from New Zealand, right, that uh, did the eDNA study of Loch Ness and all that about the, the eels. He said it would be $450,000, correct, to do? Well, somewhere in that range. He said uh, two hundred to uh, to $400,000 for, for a multi-year project, basically. And, and it, to do it, he would want to have a, a postdoc and maybe a couple of graduate students devoted to the project because he's pulled in so many different directions. He couldn't devote his attention singly to this one project. <clears throat> and exactly, he was one of the geneticists. It was actually one of his former graduate students that I bumped into. And so those conversations are still underway. Uh, they kind of uh, uh, they kind of got uh, the uh, dampers uh, uh, put on them when COVID hit. And so the past year, it sort of stalled. And, and uh, he's very eager to come over to assist with the uh, with uh, sample collection and so forth. And so until travel restrictions are lifted and, and uh, it's more uh, feasible for him to do that and vice versa, um, then uh, we're, we're still uh, in the very formative stages of, of those conversations. But I think that's the way, that's the way to go. I mean, it, it, it tackles two things. It ta one, it tackles the, the issue that we've been discussing right here, but then even more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that um, we're looking for the proverbial moving needle in a haystack. And given the rarity of these creatures, it's it's just, uh, you know, finding the sample, uh, collecting the tissue is uh, is very challenging. And if we can employ a technique that takes a much broader approach to collecting DNA from the environment instead of from directly from the uh, donor, then it ups the odds of, uh, of uh, winning the lottery. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. You know, one of the other challenges, I think, is uh, that the thing that's kind of missing from a lot of eyewitness accounts or, you know, Bigfoot's make this structure, Bigfoot broke this tree, Bigfoot does this or that, is a one-to-one -one correlation between an actual Sasquatch and the thing you're collecting from. Um, and, and the nests are promising, but we don't know. No one's seen them make it. I mean, but 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 it's a very good bet. Um, I guess the other, which brings up my uh, thought of um, how viable is it to collect the soil from underneath footprints or perhaps the soil on footprints that you have to clean off later, like from the cast? Um, how viable a collection um, strategy would that be? Well, I think it's, it, it, that is a good, a good and viable strategy, right? And, and you raised the, the excellent point, and that is, uh, this moving needle in the haystack, you know, like I said, it's going to be one of the rarest elements in any environmental DNA sample that's taken. And uh, with the hope, with the caveat, you know, that, that uh, uh, you know, the assumption that, uh, that there is some Sasquatch contribution. And you're right, the nests, we, we think, based on the circumstantial evidence and, and, uh, and some of the associative evidence, that uh, that they were made by Sasquatch, but we don't know for certain. And so, uh, not finding Sasquatch DNA in that doesn't rule out the existence of Sasquatch. But it just uh, it um, may cast doubt on them as being the source of of the um, these nests. Um, but yes, collecting samples from under footprints is another way to up the odds, uh, you know, I, I don't have a good sense of how much 
tissue or um, a trace is shed with each footstep. You know, I know that there certainly there's abrasion and there's uh, oils and secretions and so forth that are that potentially could transfer to the soil surface. And you know, I always have this vision. <laughs> <laughs> of any any animal walking along and having its appendages literally just kind of melting away into the soil as it leaves all of its its uh, DNA and cellular structure <laughs> left behind in each footprint. In other words, you know, it, there can't be a lot of material that's shed and left behind. Otherwise, we would just kind of whittle away, wouldn't we, and disappear. <laughs> so it's going to be uh, very, a, a real trace and uh, although, you know, there, there, there certainly is precedent. And there was that example I was looking for it, actually, in between watching episodes of Finding Big. But I was trying to find that episode where the researcher uh, collected the, um, uh, or the documentary, not the episode, the documentary where the researcher collected the snow under the Yeti footprint and uh, identified some DNA from that sample. And I haven't been able to find that. I... Uh, I did find the episode with uh, Mark Evans and the uh, samples from Bhutan uh, that turned out to be bare. And, you know, I identified that researcher, but uh, that did the DNA on that. I'm always, my, I, my, you know, my ears always uh, prick up when uh, I see uh, a researcher who's willing to, uh, uh, under the right circumstances, to uh, apply their skills to questions like this without without uh, fear of uh, ridicule or retribution. Uh, Jeff, if you gave someone, say, half a million dollars, and you're talking about that thousand windows, like the advent calendar, like with a thousand slots, how many windows would you be able to open with, like, uh, say you gave half a million dollars to these geneticists? Well, according to Dr. Gamble, that's that's what he'd need to conduct a... Like open all thousand? A well-staffed, yeah, a, to open all thousand, yeah, to a, a, conduct a well-staffed, a study that would allow him to examine, and I and I would assume, you know, in the conversations I've had with him, uh, uh, I'm assuming that, that that's his intent uh, is to do as much sequencing as, as is necessary. But you wouldn't know it's a damaged sample or not good enough sample until he got so far into it, right? So you could burn up a bunch of your capital. Yeah, you could, and you then, then may have to to drop back ten yards and punt and uh, gather some additional samples and turn your attention to those. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he would not, uh, that his, his research design would not be focused on a single sample. I'm sure it would involve the collection of many samples. I mean, just like they did with Loch Ness, they, they filtered water from uh, probably hundreds, if not uh, thousands of locations at various depths in the lake in order to make a very uh, thorough survey of the of the water in the lake, so it wasn't just you know one sample, one one test tube, but but many many times uh, repeated. Didn't you guys? Get, didn't you, uh, you? You thought your best bet was some like real remote mountain lake in the Rockies? Like I don't know if it was uh, John Mianchinski that got it or something. But I thought you, you thought your best chance were these samples. You got some mason jars or something from up in up high where no one goes was that it well no i we hadn't uh, talked much beyond i mean I, I think the study would would do well to start with uh things like the nests that have been found in the olympic project you know and if if, if another set of very fresh nests could be found i think that would be an ideal place or as you pointed out if someone finds a set of footprints then hey if we can be on that spot ASAP and, you know, before a lot of onlookers and so forth and, and scoop up the soil from, uh, from those footprints, beneath those footprints and, and collect that, uh, then that would be another ideal situation. I, I think, you know, some of the, our, our previously tried methods like double-sided tape, you know, industrial strength, double-sided tape and uh, the hair snags that, that John Mianzinski designed. Um, and, and other, you know, there are, uh, there are, uh, tried and true, if you will, um, hair collecting techniques for wildlife studies. And, and those can be 
perhaps modified so as to lessen the chance of interaction with common wildlife and, you know, choosing the proper height or the proper types of baits or, or whatever in order to in, potentially engage a Sasquatch, preferentially over, you know, over a bear or a porcupine or a you know, marmot or something. You mentioned earlier um, the Gigantopithecus study that was published not too long ago, putting them directly in line or at least closely related to Shivapithecus and therefore orangutans later. Um, and that was a study of the proteins, if I remember correctly. Is it proteonics? Is that the right word? Since we do have a small sampling or small set of hairs that um, have been attributed to Sasquatches or at least great apes collected in North America of some sort, could that same technology of studying the proteins be applied to the hair and get some idea of the lineage there? Well, that's an interesting proposition that I really hadn't thought about. And uh, if, if the uh, keratin in the hair would lend itself to that kind of analysis, and if, it, if there are sufficient distinctions in the, the structure of uh, keratin in hair between mammal species, that, that uh, those differentiations could be made. And honestly, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Another approach with hair that has been discussed, I've discussed with, with people who are involved in, in this type of research, is a stable isotope analysis, uh, where um, uh, stable isotopes of various molecules are, uh, are deposited in the hair and produce a very distinctive signature based on the, um, particularly the diet of the uh, organism growing that hair. And that um, while this is not a precise science in the sense that, well, the science is precise, but the identifications are not precise. Let's put it that way. The correlations are not precise. Um, and so, and, and, uh, but baselines and, and generalizations can be made about various taxonomic groups um, based on the signature of the, of the stable isotopes. And those technologies are getting more and more accessible. And so I, I've had people who do that kind of research who have expressed interest and, and uh, willingness to maybe try their hand at that. So we could determine that you know, these alleged Sasquatch hairs have a um, have a um, stable isotope signature that is quite distinct from from humans in that region and from bears and you know the the gross morphology of the hair is such that there aren't very many potential candidates for um, producing that hair. I mean, uh, when you have a hair that's three to four inches long, four to five inches long. That, that has all primate characteristics rather than the features of, of a long guard hair of a mammal like a bear or a elk or a fox or coyote. You know, there aren't many animals that mammals that would produce a hair that of those dimensions and, and, and those configurations. So you're only, you're, you, you immediately just by the process of elimination on the basis of the morphology, narrow it down to just uh, three or four, candidates in my mind in my book you know there's some people say oh you've got to test you've got to make sure you know but i mean you know we can rule out all the little tiny rodents that have hair that's only a quarter of an inch long and uh, and much finer than any hair from a potential sasquatch do you know how many legitimate hair samples like that have passed muster as far as we know without genetics but how, how many, I mean, I, I imagine there's way more foot casts. I mean, it's got to be a factor of 10, 20 to 1. But how many, how, many hair, how many hair samples are you aware of that you think are legitimate? You know, I don't have a precise count for you, but uh, b before Dr. Fehrenbach retired, he f it felt like he had a, somewhere between a dozen and two dozen samples that in his book met the, quote, gold standard, which he uh, he arrived at, and that was basically... You know, they look like human. They have parallel sides. They're about 65 microns uh, in diameter. They lack a cellular medulla. They have a wear pattern. Uh, there's no taper to the tip. Um, they have some very distinctive uh, combination of pigment granules and lozenges. There's, uh, they show a, 
a range of variation between uh, proportions of eumelanin and pheomelanin. So you get all the color phases from almost uh, white through beige and, and uh, buckskin to reddish brown and then uh, dark brown and black, almost mahogany black with a reddish hint to it. Um, so yeah, somewhere between between 12 and 24 in that range. And, and I've identified additional ones that uh, when we really had a push back when Dr. Sykes had his study underway and uh, we were screening hairs to potentially include in his study. So you have the resources and the knowledge now to definitively say gold standard if you if you, you have enough to judge yourself now without going to someone else with your resources that would someone give you a hair sample right oh yeah yeah and i've done that uh you know a couple have fallen through the cracks i'm trying to find uh you know a misplaced sample here or there but yes i've been receiving quite a number of samples and uh and uh of course not all of them uh, not, uh, very, actually you know it runs about one in ten are of interest uh and one in ten match the gold standard. So I wouldn't say definitively. It's always a, it's a bit of an art form. I mean, it's still anatomy, and and there you put them under the microscope, and there are features. Um, but there's but the art, the the art and the skill comes into play because of the variation of the appearance of hair on a single individual, depending on where it's collected. You know, I mean, with a human, you've there head hair or body hair or pubic hair, uh, you know, or eyelashes or eyebrows, and that's about it. But, uh, you know, on your dog, the hair on its back, the hair on its belly, the, you know, all those, they, they have different uh, appearances and different uh, uh, pigmentation and banding patterns and so forth. And, and uh, but, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If, if it's a fur-bearing mammal, which, again, the candidate's, that are of, on the, the proper scale to, to uh, potentially be suspected or attributed to a Sasquatch. Um, they have fur, not just hair. And that distinction refers to the differentiation of the outer guard hairs, the longer, coarser hairs, which provide um, mechanical protection, basically. That's their principal function. So they're longer, stiffer, coarser, the under fur is the insulative layer. So those hairs are very fine. They're kind of kinky sometimes to, to create that sort of poofed um, uh, appearance rather than laying down flat. And, uh, and those are very, very different. But when someone sends a sample uh, of a tuft of hair and it has both of those types of hair within, it's fur. And uh, you know, we can immediately... Uh, we can immediately uh, eliminate it, or we can stick another microscope and point out all the distinctions between the two types and uh, from a typical primate hair. But uh, yeah, but when you, I mean, yeah, the, the image is, is pretty um, distinctive. And uh, when you've got a sample that matches the gold standard, and these things, that's what's crazy about it is, uh, is so compellingly crazy about it, I guess, is that here are samples that are collected by independent investigators that um, are from various, you know, geographical regions uh, across the map, and yet they all look like they came off the same critter. They all have the exact same morphology, and and uh, that's really quite compelling. I mean, that's that's what kind of set us down this road. When I first met and conferred with Dr. Fehrenbach, we both were kind of puzzling over this situation with the hair and uh, there were various reports that had been disseminated invariably uh, the reliable reports came back as indeterminate uh, for those samples that that held potential of being sasquatch hair and that was really the only justifiable conclusion that could be arrived at because the way you identify hair is to compare it to a known standard well, if there is no known standard for Sasquatch, then what you end up with this enigmatic hair, it doesn't match anything else. But you have no standard to match it to, so it's indeterminate. Well, we thought if these hairs, if there, if there is a population of hairs 
out there, a sample of hares that all uh, defy attribution to any commonly known wildlife out there. There must be some common denominators that that discriminate it, that, dis- that set it apart. So we started backtracking. We actually contacted some of the sources of, of these reports and asked for more detailed descriptions of their samples. And lo and behold, there were, you know, you know, they had these same characteristics that I already rattled off. And, and across the board, they consistently, all these indeterminate uh, hares, which if they were Sasquatch, they're conceivably coming from one species and therefore should show a consistently distinctive suite of characters. And sure enough, they did. And that sort of became the gold standard, as Henner referred to it. So everything else he would find, you know, that became our default standard, even though we didn't have um, you know, claims to the contrary, any examples of hairs physically pulled out of a Sasquatch and, uh, and identified as such with which to compare it. So, yeah, I'm pretty confident. I mean, no hair, like I said, anatomy is anatomy. And we have hairs that defy attribution to any form of wildlife. How, how can other biologists ignore that? I don't, I don't understand, like, if some, like, other hair, like, hair specialists... Uh, zoologist, whatever. If you show them this, what? How, how do they just dis, just dismiss it? Well, it, it boils down to the fact that, and this is why Henner was always a little bit reluctant to go out on the limb and publish, try to get this published in a mainstream journal. Was that uh, these primate characteristics are also displayed by humans to varying degrees? I mean, some of them consistently. The, the Sasquatch hair is about the same coarseness as average human head hair now obviously there's variation there you know some people have very stick stiff woolly hair coarse hair some have very fine hair some humans even have an acellular medulla uh, usually it's it's individuals that are kind of toehead they're very pale blonde and have very fine hair uh, because that uh, that central core that medulla lends some uh, further rigidity to the, the hair shaft. And uh, so the one could always fall back and say, well, it's a more parsimonious conclusion to arrive at that these are just misidentified uh, human hairs, even though they've never been cut. They show no, no evidence of having been cut. You know, they're grown to length, essentially, with a worn, blunt tip. And, uh, and, and they displayed some distinctive features of the, of the follicle, but we, we didn't, uh, we don't r- only rarely have a, an active follicle that would display those. So, um, so it boils back down to the way the final arbiter that, that uh, one would rely on then is what? DNA to make the final uh, conclusive uh, determination. And, and that one factor of the acellular medulla made it very problematic to get uh, DNA from the shaft. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Well, you know, there's another avenue that I, I don't think has been explored um, that I think shows a lot of promise. And it and, and wasn't my idea by any means. Uh, the, a gentleman came into the museum here, and um, he's uh, a veterinarian. And um, he, he said this has been tried, in, and it turns out it works, um, studying the parasites in an, in an area. You can kind of – it sounds like eDNA, but you gather a bunch of ticks or something, and then uh, you test them somehow, and you can tell what they've been feeding on. Has anything like that ever been tried to your knowledge? Oh, sure. There have been been studies. And in fact, that's one element we hope to in- incorporate. So I'm glad you brought that up into, into our eDNA study is the mass collection of, of uh, mosquitoes in regions where there's Bigfoot activity or reports, you know. Um, it's again, it's, it's a shot in the dark given the rarity. I mean, what are the odds that you catch the, uh, dozen or so, uh, mosquitoes that, uh, have bitten, uh, the, the few Sasquatch that are in that geographical area, but that's, that's a, a way to do it. And there are methodologies that have been developed, uh, you know, you let put dry ice in the trap and it attracts the mosquitoes and they're caught in the trap and, 
and then you just uh, sample them in total in mass and and uh, try to determine if there's any blood elements that can be identified or dna from from those blood i mean from that blood so yeah that's that's one way to do it i think that would be more straightforward than trying to find ticks and <laughs> Yeah, and he wants to go get like, like stripped down, run naked through the brush. Like, yeah, like yeah. I have a feeling that's something that I'd be roped into. Come on, Cliff, you like Bigfoot? Do this. I'll do what it takes. Because because the ticks don't feed. I mean, once they've fed, my understanding is once they have that blood meal, then they go off and they lay their eggs basically and die. And die. I th- yeah, it's just like their annual plants or something, right? Right. And so I don't know what the chance. I mean, and and you know, the mosquitoes are quite ephemeral as well. So I don't. It's, uh, it, you know, you have to have your, your sights lined up <laughs> pretty precisely in order to, to hit the bullseye. It's, uh, it's, you know, just to contemplate it, it's uh, almost uh, overwhelming to think about the odds of success. But like I said in, uh, earlier, I think that's the direction, unless you want to just keep on doing the same old, same old. And quite honestly, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm, not going to physically be able to do the kind of uh, remote field research. And, and I've done so much of it with, uh, you know, limited, as much as I enjoy it, I, with limited uh, results. Um, I don't know that it's the best use of uh, time and resources. Yeah, we should just cancel all the Bigfoot uh, conventions and gatherings and Everyone take a year off Squatch and take all that money you spend on gas and food and all that and throw it all in a giant pot. We'd have enough money to get this DNA study done. Well, yeah, and certainly will will appeal. I mean, once I I have some benefactors who have been uh, very generous in supporting other research initiatives, and but uh, but yeah, I would like to see uh, sort of a grassroots participation by those who are interested at some point but uh, we'll uh, we'll wait until we get uh, a very uh, solid research design and commitments and and so forth underway i i'm hoping to do some r- uh, smaller scale preliminary um uh, studies this summer uh things of uh, you know the, the timetable on vaccinations and travel restrictions and everything i think is uh, moved up sufficiently to be able to to do that just to just to go through the, I mean, if nothing else, just to go through the motions, but who knows, you know, you may get lucky on, on the first sample or two and something, it produces something, but uh, that would be great. Well, then the other samples just go to reproducing that same thing, which is the aspect of science, of course, that a lot of people overlook, you know. I thought about bringing ladders out in the woods and going up and checking bird nests. I heard you can find them pretty easy that way. You know, people don't realize how, and this is this is one of the challenges, but people don't realize how persistent hair is in the environment. So there have been numerous cases where uh, a potentially credible and authentic encounter or observation was made, and then a sample of hair was found nearby, and it was, uh, again, connecting those dots. We're back to the storytelling. And so it was taken in and, and uh, analyzed. You know, one that comes to mind because it actually resulted in a published paper was up in the Yukon when there was a sighting and then they found some uh, tuft of hair on a barbed wire fence, I think it was, and took it into the fishing game. And they, to their credit, looked at it and, and uh, sent it into the lab and had it analyzed. And it came back as muskox or something like that. And, and, of course, then that got published. If, if it had come back as an indeterminate primate, I can guarantee you it wouldn't have been published. But, but the you know, it's kind of like in politics. The bad news is <laughs> always gets the headlines, and the good news rarely, rarely gets mentioned. But, um, but, see, that's what's so unfortunate, too, about that situation, then, is, is it uh, biases the perception with the negativity in other words um it's just like uh, my my biggest criticism of uh, dr sykes uh published study was that all of his samples you know when i when i visited with him uh before the project was underway and i offered to help screen samples 
to focus his attention on those gold standard samples. I mean, to really try because he thought he you know could overcome the the challenge of of uh, the the lack of a cellular medulla and uh, and and glean some DNA from the shafts using his techniques. So I was very eager, you know, to focus his attention because he was limited in the resources. Again, he only had enough money to open 10 doors, you know. And, uh, but instead, he insisted, oh, no, no, we can't impose any preconceptions. You know, we have to, we have to look at everything. Well, I said, well, you throw open the barn doors. And I said, the whole barnyard's going to come in then. And that's what happened. But the thing, the, the real criticism was uh, he got DNA from every single sample. That's just not conceivable. That's just not conceivable. And, and there were samples um, that were submitted that apparently uh, were not acknowledged in the study. So my fear is, and I, you know, I hate to, to disparage or say something negative, but my concern was that there were samples that didn't yield DNA that weren't mentioned that weren't included in the final uh, analysis. Well, that, that produces a very different result. If you publish a result that every sample you receive turns out to be something else, every single sample was attributable to a commonly f- known form of wildlife, that's very different than if the result was we had 30 samples and 24 of them were attributable to other forms of wildlife because I threw the barn door open. But there were these six that we couldn't even get DNA from. And isn't it interesting, those six also look very similar to the gold standard Dr. Meldrum has described repeatedly. Now, wouldn't that be a different result than the first? Yeah, much more promising. Yeah, I mean, that leaves the door open that, uh, that one of those samples you have might actually have come, or one of those six samples might have actually come from a Sasquatch. Did you submit any samples at Sykes Exam that you thought were good? Yes, that weren't collected by me personally, but came through me, and uh, and they weren't they weren't acknowledged in the paper. So oh, I thought you were talking theoretically. So you, that did happen. Oh no, I was not talking theoretically. No, no. What I described is what happened, and what didn't happen. You know, what I described is what happened. There, there were myself included, there were people who said, but um, I don't see my sample. I sent him three samples and I don't see them mentioned here. You know, he may have gotten far more than he could possibly process and test because like I said, he was on a limited budget, which is why I encouraged him to focus on, on those that had the most promise. You know, it's like I said, you can eliminate the fur bearing animals right away. You know, we, we know that, I mean, if Sasquatch exists, it is a primate. Anyone who contests that just doesn't understand biology, or you know, it's just that simple. I mean, we're, we're we've got we've got to be able to say some things based on eyewitness accounts, accounts, and and the anatomy of the foot. You know, unless some strange uh, creature has emerged from the ether that that has a primate foot and and the non-primate physiology and anatomy otherwise. Anyway, so, I mean, we, we I think we're perfectly justified and safe in, in making the assumption that if Sasquatch exists, it is a large primate of some type. And so it will have hair uh, that is most similar, more likely than not, most similar to other large-bodied hominoid primates. So, and none of them are fur-bearing. The, even the you know mountain gorilla that gets up into freezing temperatures at times, it still has hair. It's denser. It's much denser than its uh, its sibling species down in the tropical uh, lower elevations. But uh, it has hair, and uh, one one type of hair. So yeah, no that that was a real frustrating frustrating outcome and disappointing outcome of that. Uh, of that whole enterprise but uh, but no that was real that was not i wasn't just theorizing uh, you know a what if scenario that that's what actually happened it sounds like um the um obtaining a piece of the sasquatch in some way 
I mean, obviously, a, a type specimen would be the end all be all. But uh, obtaining some little piece of the of, of a Sasquatch, whether it's DNA or hair or something, seems to be the direction that um, amateur researchers like myself should be focused on. Would you agree with that? Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. If we could, uh, you know, and, and I and I thought a lot about that too. Uh, you know, in addressing the question of where's the bones. You know, I, I, I end up with this kind of, uh, con- not convoluted, uh, but a, a lengthy laundry list of, of factors involved in the, the disposition of remains once an animal dies, you know, the science of taphonomy. And um, so the question is, where, where would you find remains? You know, of, of the 1.5 million years in which uh, Gigantopithecus had a tenure in Eastern Asia, where did we find the, the uh, fossils? In limestone caves, right? And we only found those uh, because porcupines dragged them in there. So, um, you know, for all that, uh, all that time and all those dead Gigantopithecus, we've got two jaws and a few thousand isolated teeth. And only in those areas where porcupines live, south of the Yellow River in China. I've, I've thought I've often thought about that and thought, well, gee, maybe you know, well. First of all, Sasquatch may have only been in the, in North America for a few hundreds of thousands of years, not millions of years. Uh, perhaps not. I mean, we don't know. We have no way of knowing. But I'm or even less, really, right? Or even less. Yeah, of course. Could I mean, be tens of thousands of years. Exactly. Exactly. It could very well. And so the uh, the chances of finding uh, uh, remains, fossilized remains, are, are very slim, really. But uh, where would we find them? Probably in limestone caves. So um, I've often, and I've, and I've asked, I've talked to some cavers, and there are some who, uh, who mention, you know, finding bones of, of various mammals and so forth in, in caves that they've explored. But uh, to reach out to societies or clubs, cavers clubs, and, and see if anybody has any stories, you know, there, there's kind of a... a, a a cultish kind of secrecy about uh, their favorite caves. They don't want people, they don't want to manage, they don't want people um, uh, disturbing them. And so there's not a lot broadcast about to the location of caves. But if you could win over the confidence of, of some cavers, I have reached out to some in the region here and, and uh, uh, nothing has come forward. No one has any interesting experience to share of stumbling on a, a jaw or a tooth or <laughs> giant thigh bone in a in a cave uh, deposit but uh, that would be uh, that would be the place to look i think yeah be ideal because uh, w- whether p- people like it or not uh, a dead one is is the path to discovery right of course and it's just uh, again it's a, it's a rare commodity that's the thing you know we've had c- conversations and i've talked on in various settings about uh, addressing the question, how many Sasquatch are out there? And, and uh, anyway, without without going into that, I don't think there are very many. You know, here in the state of Idaho, there's a lot of wilderness area. We have, uh, you know, two thirds of the state is roadless wilderness area. And and um, in, the, in the entire state of Idaho, I would put the number somewhere between, oh, probably around 300 compared to the 35,000 black bear that live in Idaho. Black bear only live to be about 20 years old before they die. And uh, Sasquatch may, as a large-bodied ape, may live, you know, 50 years, may at least twice that of black bear. Of those 300, how many are in their golden years? So what would be the mortality rate of Sasquatch on an annual basis in, in just the state of Idaho? And then, and then, what are the odds that, a, that the Sasquatch that dies is somewhere where uh, a backpacker or a hiker or, you know, in these vast wilderness areas is going to find it if it even is left somewhere that it might be found? Because a large animal with no natural predators, etc., you know, they secrete themselves off into some nook or cranny and uh, or even if they're exposed, they're going to quickly be um, deconstructed and decomposed and, and carted off by the gnars and the chewers and scavengers. And, and, uh, pretty soon there just isn't anything left. 
You know, we have a display here in, in the in the museum on where the bones are, and um, I was fortunate enough to get uh, two photographs donated um, to the museum to use in the display. And each of those photographs shows an elk eating away at a bone. And, and even the seasoned hunters who come in here are blown away by that those photographs. It's, I had no idea. So, yeah, there's an elk. Like there you go, and deer do it too. And yeah, and of course squirrels and porcupines, and you know the the, the those that have the uh, the teeth, the ever growing incisors. I mean, there's a another motivation for them. But but calcium is at a real premium in uh, speci- particularly in wet coniferous forest environments, and so that. Uh, the recycling of the skeleton is prompt and thorough. That's like with the, you know, with Gigantopithecus, the only remains we have are the, the fact that they have teeth with hyper thick enamel uh, on these crowns and, um, and these very heavy, heavy jaws that uh, the thickest parts are not, uh, are, are those that survived and only two of them so far. <laughs> I mean, we've only discovered two, but it shows that, uh, a very few number of them uh, of the jaw elements have survived to be discovered in these caves. And you know, there's been a lot of harvesting in those caves. The, the people who, uh, you know, who excavate that limestone really go to town. And of course they find anything interesting. They um, hold on to it for trade for various purposes. Yeah. Feed their family mostly. Right. <laughs> Krantz mentioned in, in his recreation of the Gigantopithecus skull based on the jaw that the jaw showed divergence um, that was really big. He, I think he even said maybe even unmatched uh, at that point. Is that, is that still true? Like, uh, do you think that, that the divergence of the Gigano jaw um, does lean towards um, or indicating bipedalism? You know, that's that, that came up uh, in a conversation recently, and I, and I thought then, too, that I – I really need to go back and look very carefully at his argument. My understanding of it, I mean, you, you, bipedalism has not, to my understanding, influenced the span, the, the absolute span between the jaw joints, between the temporal mandibular joints. But what he was trying to draw attention to was the angle that was subtended by the bodies of the jaw and, and that angle was more acute in, say, a gorilla, but more obtuse, uh, more open, in other words, in Gigantopithecus. Therefore, that indicated that there was room for the neck in between the bodies of the, of the mandible. Now, there, there's, I mean, the one weakness, well, let me point out, first, first there's one little gap in my knowledge, and that is, is, um, and I could re- resolve this just by going over here to the bench top and measuring, but the absolute breadth uh, of the uh, cranial base, the distance between those two jaw joints versus that angle. Now, the angle is going to change simply because the face of Gigantopithecus was flatter, probably. We don't know for certain because we don't have a skull, but if if the megadontia, if the hypertrophy of the teeth and the thick molar, hyper thick molar enamel is convergent with the condition in the robust Australopithecines like Paranthropus and Australopithecus robustus in South Africa, then it stands to reason that Gigantopithecus was loading the posterior teeth and had a flatter face. Now the anterior teeth, it had shorter Canines, they didn't have the huge projecting canines of a gorilla, say, but the but the incisors are kind of spatulate. They're kind of uh, shoveled, and uh, uh, you know the, the central incisors are large compared to the lateral, which is more like an orangutan than say a chimp or a gorilla. Uh, but they're not greatly reduced in size, as in the robust Australopithecines where they really emphasize the posterior dentition in combination with this kind of dished out face, these jutting cheekbones and so forth. So the point is, I mean, the short version of that is Gigantopithecus and robust Australopithecines seem to have converged on, on diets that had similar mechanical properties that selected for these robust jaws and thick enameled teeth, thick crowned teeth. Um, but 
they did it in different ways. They clearly were not related in that respect because, again, here, here's where stable isotope analysis comes in. The stable isotope analysis of these two species show that they had a very distinctive diet. The diets may have tough, hard objects in common, but the nature of those foodstuffs was quite distinctive. Different habitat types and so forth, and different plant communities. So back now, circle way back around. Sorry, I didn't mean to go down that path so far. Um, if you shorten the face, the angle between the two halves of the jaws becomes more obtuse and gives the appearance of of opening up for the accommodation of a neck that comes out under under the the head. Now, uh, one of the distinctions, if if we can rely for a minute on the PG film. Uh, Patty has a forward lean of about five degrees. Her trapezius attached on the back of her skull about halfway between the very high attachment in a gorilla with a foramen magnum way behind the skull versus a human, which is tucked down underneath. And the muscles likewise are very small and tucked in underneath. Head balances much more easily because of our smaller face and big globular brain case. Um, if you look at robust Australopithecus, it's more towards the human condition by far than the gorilla, but it still is not quite there. The, it doesn't have that in huge enlargement of the cranial uh, cavity. And so the foramen magnum appears to be a little bit further back, uh, but not as far as in a gorilla. And the muscles are still quite substantial uh, that attach on the base of its skull, but don't attach nearly as high doesn't have that big flat plane of muscle attachment that uh, that nuchal planum that's distinctive of the gorilla so was so so in other words um, back to your original question was grover's analogy was his was his theory about uh, bipedal posture in gigantopithecus justified well i don't know if it really is um, uh, in that sense now see i i come at it as a locomotor anatomist, and um, uh, one of the reasons for bipedalism, one of the mechanical factors in any theory about the evolution of bipedalism, is that you, your starting point is a large-bodied hominoid that has a pectoral girdle, the upper limb um, bones that are rearranged in such a way that they're adapted for uh, suspending from supports, hanging under branches, and or climbing with the arms up overhead, climbing up through branches or up tree trunks. Our chest is flatter, our shoulder blade is back, our, um, our glenoid, the shoulder socket faces outward. If you look at a gorilla or chimp, it faces slightly upward. The problem with that arrangement is when you come to the ground and assume a quadrupedal posture, now the shoulder blade, if you can imagine, is horizontal, and the humerus, the arm bone, is vertical. So the shoulder meets at an angle, funny, at a 90-degree angle almost. Well, joints don't like that. The, uh, that produces shear forces, pushing one bone uh, past another. And so all dedicated quadrupeds, like your dog, look at where its shoulder blade is. It's vertical on the side of a, of a narrowly compressed chest, and it's aligned with the shoulder or with the um, arm bone. So now the joint is experiencing compression. The bones are pressing together, and, and they, they prefer that mechanically. Plus, there's other, you know, you could, we could bring in the elbow and the wrist. You know, a lot of people have trouble. I mean, the reason, the reason they sell these, um, these gadgets that have hand grips on, on a base to do push-ups you know, on the floor, is because a lot of people, if you put your hands on the floor, it causes pain in your wrist because your wrist is not designed to be flexed like that and then have compressive force applied through it. You know, when I do push-ups, I do them on the backs of my knuckles so that my wrist is lined up with my forearm. And you, you try that, and it's much easier on your wrist. Um, so the bottom line is, any large-bodied ape that comes to the ground is going to modify the way it moves around. Now, a great ape that has, has tremendously evolved in the direction of arm hanging, arm swinging, like a gorilla, so that its arms are almost twice as long as its legs, 
it's already at this funny angle when it comes down. It's not like a true quadruped. And, and weight is actually actively retracted back onto the hind limbs. They carry more weight on their hind It doesn't look like it, but they're actually, if you have them walk across a force plate, it shows their hind limbs are, are supporting more weight than their forelimbs. They avoid the stresses on their wrists by walking on their knuckles instead of on their fists or their palms. For the same reason you just mentioned you do knuckle, pr- knuckle push-ups. Exactly. So if you were a, a great big ape getting even bigger than a gorilla, like a Gigantopithecus, first of all, um, it, it's dangerous to be climbing up in trees, just like the big male gorillas rarely go up. They do. We, we've discovered for a long time they thought they didn't. But, uh, but it's dangerous. If you fall, it's probably going to be a, a fatal experience either, either uh, immediately or, or uh, as a result of the injuries incurred. And so uh, you're going to spend more time on the ground, in other words. If you're on the ground, there's only two options open to you. You either walk on all fours or you stand up like Ambam there at the London Zoo likes to do, you know, in that, in that way. Um, so that's my argument. Uh, all of the things I just discussed are going to be amplified with increasing body weight. And so uh, a gigant, a proto, uh, proto Sasquatch is going to uh, tend to walk upright more when it's on the ground to avoid those st- stresses on its upper extremity and, uh, and uh, would probably be much better at it than even Ambam the gorilla because uh, evidence is, continues to mount that the Miocene apes had a pelvis that was much less like the living great apes, especially the chimp and the gorilla. It was much less like those. And, and uh, so the, um, uh, the selection pressures to reshape that into a more human-like and, and, and Patty doesn't have a fully human-like pelt, so you can see them. You look at the, her back loin area, she has, um, she has a, a, a dish-shaped pelvis, but she's got a pretty tall ilium. It's not as shortened as it is in humans. And so, I mean, there's, there's indications of that. So there you go. There's, there's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we have, have you on, we'll just, we'll ask for the long answer and, and Bob and I will go get a drink. <laughs> this is really a, an issue though. See, my, my point is, is that, I mean, you know, you, you ask a question like that and in, in a documentary, I could never give an answer like that. And yet, and yet the answer involves a lot of background contextual information to really understand what the significance of it is. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, Sasquatch isn't designed for our soundbite culture, unfortunately. And I think that's part of the reason people think it's ridiculous. Still, well, exactly, that- exactly. And, and those that take the time to educate themselves and really ask the question and listen to the answers and discuss them. I mean, like when we were talking about the Patterson-Gimlin film, I mean, she shows that non-human bipedal adaptations, as you what might expect for something that has evolved, perhaps convergently. Nature repeatedly produces similar results through convergent evolution. Well, there was a news item last month, if, if I may interrupt very briefly, that I, I think uh, evolution has led to crabs I think five or six times independently, you know, because because crabs happen to be the, the the shape and function and niche of a crab happens to be what things gravitate towards. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Arthropod, uh, you know, exoskeleton adaptation or, or uh, strategy. Definitely. It's uh, I mean, it's always been a fast because to me, it's such a testament of evolution. I when I when I deal with students who are reluctant to at least entertain the notion that, that life. Uh, you know, evolved through descent with modification. You know, I, I throw out just example after example after example of convergent evolution, like the classic one with all the marsupial mammals in Australia and the placental mammals of of the Nearctic. And you have, uh, you know, these convergent wolves. I mean, they, they fill each niche in remarkably similar ways, but they uh, they both started from very different starting points of these little rat-like creatures, you know, that, that radiated out to fill all these niches. And so 
So bipedalism could have evolved independently in a large body ape in Asia in parallel to the Australopithecines or Artipithecines. I mean, there's already now evolution of, of multiple examples of bipedal-like behaviors in various Miocene primates from Oreopithecus. The latest was this uh, uh, Danuvius. Danuvius was a very interesting, about a, a bonobo-sized ape that had uh, elongated lower limbs and a pelvis that was more human-like than chimpanzee-like. And uh, it uh, so it, it shows that that the change from that to us, you know, people always, even even academics sometimes, try to connect the dots between extant chimpanzees and modern humans, and that evolution was intermediate between that. Well, that's not the case. Evolution started for, for both those species, started from a starting point, uh, a creature that had some features that were much more chimpanzee-like, but others, this particularly the pelvis and other things that were much less derived than the modern chimpanzees. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if there was a hominoid species in Asia that, um, especially if it began to, uh, or was isolated in a more temperate climate where resources were on the ground rather than up in the trees, and it was utilizing fish, say, and as a protein source, and, and uh, carbohydrates were coming from uh, the understory, and uh, it's such, I mean, you can, yeah, there's all sorts of interesting, compelling scenarios that could account for this in, in very rational, reasonable ways. But anyway, I'm starting to ramble. Uh, yeah, well, you, you say ramble, but I, I think, I know if I can speak for myself, I'm, I'm eating it up. And I'm sure a lot of our audience is as well, because I don't think that you get, because we do live in a soundbite culture and people do go to, I mean, Finding Bigfoot is an entertaining show. We did legitimate Bigfoot stuff to the best of our ability. New stuff was brought up and stuff, but at the same time, it's TV, you know, and, and we, Bobo and I, and Bobo will, will grumble about it much at longer length than I would. Uh, the stuff they cut out was great as well. And you can't get the quick, easy answer. Yeah, you know, and and so you say rambling, but I I personally appreciate it. Um, people come into the shop and say, "Well, what would be the one piece of evidence?" When they say, "This just doesn't work like that, man." It's how everything fits together, and then I give them an eight minute like what I I, I start rambling for eight minutes, and they they eventually get it and kind of get the idea. It's like this isn't something that you just stick your toe in; you get it right away. I, I'm just getting warmed up at eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. I'm starting to massage my jaws and getting into it, right? <laughs> but you know, Cliff, one of my favorite stories to tell is when you were here after, before you went off on your solo, and uh, uh, after that little brief visit to, to my lab by the by the cast, and and then you went to rifling, uh, you know, turned you loose in the lab, and you called me out when you had the two uh, footprints side by side, one cast by Paul Freeman and one by Wes Summerlin. And we began to discuss, you posed the question, are these the same individuals? And we started talking, I was making comments about how uh, negative things had been said about distinctions in toe rows, angle, and stuff like that, and how this one looks like it has an arch. And, and then, you know, it was you asking the question of me that put me, you know, put my feet to the fire and, and made the penny drop. And, it, and when we laid that one cast over the other, lining up the toes, which match perfectly, and in so doing, the edge of the forefoot was still perfectly in, in al alignment. It was simply the angle of the heel segment that differed between the two and, and illustrated beautifully the action of pronation and supination, which is expressed to a bit greater degree in the Sasquatch foot than the human because of the greater mobility of the transverse tarsal joint. And I'm sitting here, you know, you talk about a smoking gun. If one person, if a person pressed you for one example, I mean, that's one that I would throw out there because boom, you know, no way that a hoaxer is going to incorporate the subtleties of detail that uh, that clearly demonstrate to someone like you or I, who've spent a lot of time looking at footprints, um, to recognize the, the the commonalities between the two, that distinctive distal pad on that gigantic big toe, and the and the di distinctive angle of the little toe flaring out to the side, but then to recognize or to be able to um, uh, incorporate appropriately 
the um, the signature of a supinated versus a pronated foot, a very flat foot versus one that's arched up a little bit, and the expression of that angle of the heel inflecting at exactly the proportional point of the mid tarsal um, um, joints, as as Rene de Hinden would say, it boggles the mind to even think to even think that that could happen. You know, and then you add other things like going to China and seeing these footprints with a transverse tarsal pressure, mid tarsal pressure ridge that was exactly like the Patterson Gimlin film site, you know, and then uh, and then finally turning all the titmus casts on their side so you could see they did almost all have a pressure ridge expressed to one degree or another. And the uh, the variation in length that Grover tried to kind of rationalize uh, was simply variation in the depth of imprint of the heel, that the forefoot from the pressure ridge indicator to the toe tips was identical in every single footprint. You know, I mean, just things like that that are so subtle and yet so profound uh, in their implication. Yeah, they are the best evidence that these things are real. Absolutely. But people want me to say, oh, it's the Patterson-Gimlin film. Look at it. It's real. Or the foot. look at this one footprint. You can't. I mean, it, it's, it's like looking at one piece of a jigsaw puzzle and saying those kittens playing in the yarn are very cute. Well, exactly. And they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. That's what's interesting is it's so interconnected, you know, so you can trace some of these, these uh, anatomies through the Patterson-Gimlin film, through this footprint example, through another one over here. And then, oh, here's a pathology. Here's the Bosberg cripple foot, you know, which has a cloud of, of, uh, of uh, suspicion hanging over it because of Ivan Marks, et cetera, et cetera. But yet I can sit with a room full of podiatrists and orthopedists and talk shop with them, and they're all fascinated by it and absolutely comfortable with the anatomy and the, and the pathology, even more subtly, the pathology that they're observing. You know, it's just uh, one thing after another, and they're, and they're all linked together in this cohesive, uh, coherent um, uh, theory of, explana- of explanation. It's just, uh, ah, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It gets me charged up. To uh, You wish you could convey... You know, distill this down into a little pill that someone could take and suddenly comprehend everything that you've gleaned over, you know, three decades of, of preoccupation with this topic. Yeah, it's not so simple, unfortunately. Well, well Jeff, we've taken... Bob, are you still there, by the way? <laughs> maybe. Maybe he fell asleep. I, most likely technological problems. He is yeah, somewhere in Montana. I know. He, he cut out a couple of times, so... Yeah, um... Well, well, Jeff, uh, it looks like uh, Bobo's still on the call, but for some reason we're not reading his audio right now. So I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity and just uh, to, to thank you on behalf of Bobo and myself uh, for coming on and spending so much time with us. Really do appreciate it. Uh, it's always enlightening. I, I love conversations with you because I always I'm a learner. You know, I was a teacher for a living, which means I'm a learner basically, and I just love to learn stuff. And there's I can't think of one conversation we've ever had where I didn't walk away knowing a bit more than before. So thank you so much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. It's always stimulating, reciprocally stimulating. Well, all right, Jeff, thank you so much again. And um, I'm sorry everybody out there can't hear Bobo, but so I'll I'll just do this. Uh, Hey, Bobo, that was great, right? Yeah, dude, it really was. All right, cool. Um, Take us home, Bobes. All right, everybody, keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 